All right, well, uh, happy Friday, and it's, uh, time is ticking away. We're at the uh, end of February now. I guess technically the end of February it will be uh, Monday. But, uh, but yeah, end of eighth week. We just have a couple of weeks left, week nine, week 10. I'll uh, post homework five uh, pretty soon. Uh, so you can take a look at that. It'll, it'll cover kind of object-oriented stuff. And, uh, and so the, uh, the last couple of weeks of class are going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge of different topics. Uh, I'll just kind of introduce a few things and touch on a, uh, a couple things here and there. Um, I'm not I'm not sure how much you guys want to see. Uh, I was thinking of spending uh, maybe one or two lectures on uh, say SQL uh, if, if that's of interest. Um, if there's uh, other topics you really want to uh, uh, see we can do that. I mean the, there's a package scikit-learn which is um, kind of the, the main staple in Python for doing uh, machine learning type things. Um, but it's such a huge package. You know, we, we could have an entire class and we probably wouldn't even cover um, half of the stuff in scikit-learn. So I'm not, I'm not sure how much, how much uh, justice I can do the package. And there's also a bit of prerequisite knowledge to use scikit-learn. Uh, so this is stats 21. Uh, there's no expectation that you've taken, say, 102A or 102B or anything like that, or you know, 101C. And so, um, you know, if I talk about something like cross-validation, I'm not sure if that if that means anything to uh, all of you or not. You know, it might be like a topic you've heard about, but uh, so so there's there's a bit of a I don't know, a bit of a fine line. I, I feel like I could probably talk about doing linear regression <laughs> in second learn, but I don't think that's exciting for you guys. Um, so anyway, uh, there, there's a bit of a balance, um, but but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we'll take a look at a few remaining uh, few more topics. But um, so anyway, uh, with today's lecture, um, we have to cover. I want to cover uh, Pythonic features. So these are. So we've seen um, in our object-oriented creation stuff, we saw quite a few of Python's features, which I think are, are really cool. When you're designing an object, you know, you use these dunder methods, these, you know, dunder, double under add, double under uh, less than, double under get item, things like that. And it kind of enables the, the usage of a bunch of other functions and like the sum or the sort and things like that. Um, and so th those, those are some really cool uh, features of Python. Um, and then we have a few other uh, Pythonic features. These are a, a lot of kind of I idiomatic expressions or just um, things, things that are designed to, uh, to make our life easier as we're coding. So you know, we saw an example of that with kind of the, uh, the conditional statement where we turn, you know, a simple assignment operation into a, you know, or a simple if-else statement with assignment into kind of a, a one-line thing. Um, okay, so here, this, this thing is called a named tuple. A named tuple is basically it's like a class definition. So if you wanted to create a class definition, uh, so I, I think one of our first examples in object-oriented programming, we had a class definition for a point, a class definition for a rectangle, and things like that. And, and the way we kind of assign values is we said, you know, define, a, we, I think our our class definition was at first just empty. We just had a doc string. And then we wanted to add attributes like point.x and point.y and things like that. Now, if, if you're going to create a class definition that has no, doesn't require its own separate individual uh, methods, then a named tuple 
could be uh, a good uh, a good choice uh, versus having to um, def define your own thing. So I, yeah, we uh, we created this thing called class point where we just kind of initialized. And really all we did was we said, we're going to assign x to self.x, assign the value y to self.y, and then we have a method for printing it out uh, in, in parentheses. Um, named tuple basically uh, does the same kind of thing. And all we're saying is that we're going to create something called a point. It's going to be a named tuple. And the named tuple just basically contains two attributes, an x and a y. And, and now, um, if we want to create instances of this point class object, okay, which is really, I guess, a named tuple, we would just say p is point one comma two, and then later on, if we ask what is p, it's going to come back. It's going to say it's a point object where x equals one and y equals two, and this basically will have the same kind of usage as if we had created values using uh, this thing, right? You would have uh, some instance of this, and you would have like p.x and p.y, and basically we have the same kind of thing. So now that we've created an instance of the tuple, we can access them using the dot notation, so we can ask, figure out what p.x is, we can get p.y, and um, you can also access them using score bracket notation. So, so that's, um, so as far as creating um, uh, classes that really just have attributes and no special methods, a named tuple is probably uh, kind of a shorthand for, for creating it. Okay, uh, Named tuples will also inherit all of the methods associated with tuples, such as comparison and tuple addition. So here I'm creating three uh, point objects where points are named tuples with attributes x and y and so we could we can compare them so this this inherits everything that um that that comes with a with a tuple so you can do p is p1 greater than p2 and it's going to compare the first uh, zero versus three zero is less than three so that's going to come back false and then when you add tuples together it basically just extends them right so this, this just becomes a brand new tuple. This is not a named tuple at all. This is just a brand new tuple uh, without, without anything. If you put, you can put these all into a list and you'll have a list of point objects. All right. Um, if you if you do need to make a more complicated version, okay, so so this we're just calling the Uber Point class, but um, but basically you could have it inherit from a named tuple, so you could create a new class that inherits from a named tuple, and then you can define your own uh, methods and other things that that make it more complicated, but. Uh, uh, but that's that. That's the uh, that's the named tuple. Okay. Let me uh, let me go ahead and give you your first uh, view quiz answer for today. And the first answer is E. E as in elephant. E as in elephant. And as I'm telling you this stuff, I'm realizing I forgot to uh, change the time of the, the opening time. So let me fix that. Okay, it should be open. All right, and the uh, and the first answer is E. E as an elephant. Okay. All right, we have um, we have a list comprehension. Okay, list comprehension is also a, a Python shorthand. Python shorthand that allows us to create lists basically out of for loops directly. Okay, so you imagine doing a for loop and uh, and you can kind of just 
wrap that for loop inside score brackets and and it becomes basically a list comprehension. So you imagine creating this own kind this kind of loop here where you start off with an empty list and then you have some kind of collection and you iterate through the collection and whatever result you get you just append append that thing to the to the existing list, okay? So basically you want to you want to go through some other kind of collection, a list, a tuple, a dictionary, something, some kind of range object. You, you go through everything there, and then you want to take all of those results and put them into a list. And, you know, you, you know basically for value in a con collection, if there's some kind of condition, append this expression, whatever it is, to the results. And basically, this, this for loop, which, again, isn't too hard to understand, you can also express it in one line, okay? And, you know, the first time you encounter a list comprehension, it might seem a, a little bit awkward, uh, just because you're not really accustomed to seeing it, but, um, again, as you become more familiar and uh, y your reading of Python will become more fluent, I think you might actually come to prefer seeing um, seeing uh, seeing list comprehensions written versus a for loop. Okay, and so so here basically you're going to have a list where all of the values in the list will be whatever this expression is, and then you'll just see okay for all the values in the collection, you know if we apply some kind of condition. So so here we're going to just do. Um, uh, a list comprehension where we're going to output x squared, x to the second power, for each x in range 1 through 11. And so now I get all of the squares from basically 1, one through uh, 100 here, 1, 4, 9, 16, etc. Okay? And that, that's it, right? So, so you see this, and, um, and this may or may not be easier to read, you know, for x in range 1 through 11, um, Take uh, you know some list and append x star star two to it. Okay. Uh, here's a uh, if you want to uh, take the thing, you can also just wrap it up in a, say a NumPy array. Okay, so we could take whatever uh, list comprehension we have and and uh, and put it into a, a NumPy array. Um, if you only want to do, say, the, the odd numbers, you can add a condition, right? So we can say x squared for x in range 1 through 11 as long as uh, x mod 2 is equal to 1. And so this will only do it for the odd numbers. And so you, could, you can kind of add some, some basic uh, conditions for the, uh, the list comprehension. And again, you know, as far as list comprehensions go, you can, you can make them complicated, but then your code becomes hard to read. And, uh, you know, I, I think <laughs> there's, you know, as you, uh, the complexity of your code over time and experience kind of follows this, this, this funny curve in that, like, in the beginning, you're just learning, so every, all of your expressions are simple. As you gain more experience, you learn, uh, you learn more kind of, features and things that you can do and your code gets more complicated and you can do all kinds of abstractions and make them really weird. And then I think over time, as you get older and um, you realize, I don't actually enjoy doing these complicated expressions, I just want simple, easy to read code. And so, you know, sure, we could make list comprehension super complicated, but if it's gonna become super complicated, probably do something that's a little bit easier to read. And so, um, um, you know, we could we can do that. Oh, okay. So here's here's another one. This one is not that that complicated. We could say, you know, here's a here's a list of strings, uh, a as bat card dove python, and we're gonna just say, you know what? I just want uh, take the values, make them uppercase uh, if the uh, length of the string is greater than two. So we're gonna take basically uh, we're gonna ignore these first two entries. And we'll take uh, the rem the remaining ones, where uh, and the, and they become capital. Um, any kind of iterable, 
is uh, can be made into a, a list comprehension. So remember, strings themselves are iterable. And when you do, uh, when you say for x in string, basically each x is going to be a character. So here we're going to say, you know what? I want um, if if x if each if the character there's a string um, string method called is is digit, right? So so we're going to go through each character and we're going to just say, uh, is it a digit? And if so, convert it to an integer. And so here we can extract the digits from some some string here. I got hello world, but there's some numbers in there, and we can extract those numbers out. Okay. Um, you can also iterate over uh, a dictionary's items. Okay. So dictionary.items are are these tuples, right? So so here is uh, the list of d.items. You got these tuples where uh, the first uh, entry in the tuple is the key and the second entry in the tuple is the value and you can iterate over that so so you could say um, uh, oh this this is kind of the uh, that, that format where you take each of these things and uh, and so here I'm doing some tuple unpacking so we're gonna say um, for key and value in D to items, we're unpacking them and then uh, and take each of these things and then, but we're only going to do it if key is not uh, a B or a D, okay? And so we get A is for apple, C is for carrots, and E is for eggs, and so on and so forth. Okay, and just like uh, list comprehensions, we can have dictionary comprehensions, okay? And a dictionary comprehension looks looks just like a list comprehension, except you have two expressions. Okay, whereas the list comprehension was um, inside the list, you have just the expression that gets stored in the list. Here we have an expression for the key. We have an expression for the value. So you're going to have uh, expression for the key colon expression for the value. Okay, and then you're going to have for the values in the collection if and then you can apply an optional if condition okay so for example we could do um, we could take this list apple mango banana cherry and the key is going to be the word uh, but with the first letter is capitalized and then the value is going to be the number of characters in uh, in the word so apple has five characters mango has five banana has six characters and cherry has six characters. Here's a, here's a dictionary where the key is the index and the value is the string. So here we're going to, um, what I can do is I can take this, take this list and remember I can enumerate the list and if you remember what enumerate does is it basically zips the items in the list with a range, right? So here I've got uh, six items in my list, and I'm going to just zip it with a range six object. So A gets paired with zero, and as gets paired with one, and back gets paired with two, so on and so forth. So we get basically all of these tuples, and then I can iterate over this, and we could say, you know, um, and basically I can turn this thing, the, uh, I could take the enumerate object and turn it into a dictionary. And I could say zero become uh, the key zero is a and the key one is as and the key, you know. I mean, this is this is silly because I could have also just said dictionary out of the enumerate, and uh, and and that would have also worked, okay. Um, but uh, but you know the the idea here is you know we could have made this index expression as complicated as we wanted to. We could have made the value expression as complicated as we wanted to. So if I wanted to change value into um, Take the value and capitalize it. Take the value and make it uppercase or something like that. We we could have done that as well. Okay. Now, if you wanted to, when you unpack, say, so here we've got enumerate, which gives us all of these tuples, where the uh, the the number is the key and the the word is the value. Okay, so 
when we uh, iterate through them, here, you know, they're being unpacked. The, those tuples are being unpacked as index and value. There's no, there's no requirement that says you have to put the index in front of the colon and the value after the colon or something like that. The, the expression that you put in for the key can be whatever you want. The expression that you put in for the value can be whatever you want. And so here I could say, you know, make value the key and, uh, and index, um, index the value, okay? And then now we have this, all right? Um, and so there's, you know, how, how you set up your dictionary comprehension is, is up to you, okay? Um, so this, this dictionary we called index map. This dictionary we call lo location map. So if you try to look up A in index map, this gives us a key error. This, this says uh, back in index map, there's no key for A. We do have a key A over here. So um, you know what you could do is you can you can combine the dictionaries, um, and we've seen different uh, ways to combine dictionaries, right? Uh, Probably the recommended form is do dictionary.update, right? You have your existing dictionary and you update it with the new entries that you want to put in. Um, but here you can actually, you can also combine dictionaries by just taking, um, I, you can do the star star scatter, right? You, you, uh, you scatter the keywords, uh, uh, keyword arguments. So I, I can take the location map, mapping dictionary and the index mapping dictionary, scatter them both, wrap everything up into another in, into another set of curly braces, and this will also combine the dictionaries. Okay, but again, the uh, probably the preferred method for combining dictionaries is to do dot update. So you take an existing dictionary, you update it with the uh, the additional dictionary, and uh, and here this is what we end up getting. So we have the words as the keys. We also have the index as the keys. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and give you your second view quiz answer for today, which is the letter C. C as in cat. All right. Um, there's something known as a generator, okay? A generator expression and a generator is a lot like a list comprehension. And, um, and at first you might, you might wonder, why do we even bother with these things, okay? Um, so with a, with a generator expression, you create them the, the difference is you wrap them in parentheses rather than square brackets, and the result is a generator object, and you get the, the values in the generator using next. So, so here, I'm going to create a generator object, I'm going to call it g, and it's going to be uh, n squared for n in range 12. So basically, we're gonna, it's going to start off with, uh, with 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, up to basically 11 squared, right? And um, so it looks basically like a list comprehension, except curved braces instead of, uh, you know, parentheses instead of square brackets. Uh, if we ask, what is G? We get a generator object. And here, you know, I ask, what's next G? And it's going to come back and it's going to say 0. Next G gives me 1, next G gives me 4, next G gives me 9. And it's going to keep, every time I ask for next, it's going to give me the next value in the, uh, in the generator object. And, and so this just seems inconvenient. <laughs> um, and we can kind of iterate through all of uh, all the values in G. We can say for the values in G, print the values, and it picks up where we left off and says, okay, now you got... 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared, you know, up to up to 11 squared. Okay? And then once you reach the end, if you call next G again, you get you get an error. It says uh, stop the iteration. There's no more, there's nothing left for the generator to generate, right? It's, uh, it's, it's reached the end of its generator expression. Okay? And so 
you know, when I first saw this, I was like, why, why do we want this? Like, the list comprehension is so much better, okay? Well, the, uh, the thing is that the generator expression is what we call lazy, in that, um, you know, uh, the list comprehension, you know, you say, hey, give me um, the, all the numbers from zero to uh, a million squared or a billion squared, okay? And the list comprehension says, oh, I better get on that, and it's going to generate, it's gonna figure out every single value from zero to one billion squared, and then it's going to store it all in a list, okay? Whereas the generator expression is, is very lazy and, and says, uh, okay, I'll do that, uh, but only when you ask me for it, okay? And so, um, so it's not going to spend any resources right now bothering it. it just it's just kind of like a set of instructions, and then when you say, "Hey, what's what's uh, what's the next value?" It's because oh, next value is sixteen. Next value is twenty-five, and then yeah, you know what? Um, I know you asked for up to a billion squared, but I didn't actually think you were going to get to a billion squared. So, you know, I figured you'd you'd get bored after uh, you know six hundred thousand. So. Um, so aren't you glad I didn't waste any time <laughs> coming up with all of the numbers for, you know, um, you know, a million through a billion and stuff like that, right? So the generator expression is, is only going to generate the next value when it's asked to do so. And so depending on what it is that you're trying to uh, evaluate, the generator expression could be um, preferred over the list comprehension. Because again, um, if you need to create like a big thing or something that could potentially become big, the list comprehension is going to demand that all of these numbers get figured out right now and store them away inside you know, some, some location in memory. And it, and it could end up being this very, very, very big, uh, big object that takes up a lot of space in memory. So it's kind of like, uh, it, it's a little bit like uh, the infinite scroll on a website. Okay, so when you have a feed that has, you know, you go on Instagram or something like that, um, when you reach the bottom of the page, it fetches more stuff from the server and says, okay, here, you want more stuff? Here's more stuff. Rather than trying to load the entire, I mean, whatever the entire feed is, right? So, so imagine you've been scrolling for like 20 minutes and you have all of the stuff on your, um, in your browser, right? And so, um, can you imagine how long it would take, let's say it said you want, it wanted to load all of that thing all at once, right? And that would just eat up all of your data, and it would take a while for that page to load even in the first place on your phone, okay? And so, um, you know, the, they're not using generator expressions, but it's kind of the idea that it's only gonna add more stuff to the bottom of the web page when you scroll down to the bottom. And then it says, oh, you're reaching the bottom of the web page. Here, I'll get you more stuff. I'll get you more stuff. But, uh, but you know, just in case you get bored of continuing to scroll, um, you know, we're not going to try to fetch the entire server. Um, some more, uh, more expressions here. Um, so yeah, so here's uh, just a simple example, n squared for n in range 1000, g squared for this. So if you ask, this is, L is gonna be a list, okay? So this one's the list comprehension, down here is the generator expression. Again, these things look almost identical, the only difference is the square versus the, uh, the curly brace, okay? We ask how much, how much space does this take in memory? The list comprehension, basically the list, takes up, uh, you know, 90-24 as far as, because it needs to store all of these things, as far as the generator, it, uh, it, it takes up a lot less space. It's basically instructions that says do this on the fly. Okay. Um, the difference is, is if you want to say get the, uh, the fourth value, okay, so this is just n times two, if you want to get the fourth value in the list, you can get it right away because it has already figured this out. When you want this from the generator, it can't give you the fourth value because, well, it, 
um, it hasn't even thought of that number yet. Okay, it only just thinks of the next immediate thing. Okay, so sometimes, so so you have to kind of think about it, your use case, and if you go, okay, I need to know this position right away, or and I need this on the fly, where I need to get the fourth value. Sometimes I need the thirtieth value. Sometimes I need the twelfth value. Then in that case, the list comprehension will be better. But if you kind of only need things sequentially as as things are flowing, the generator is going to be you know a little bit more efficient. Okay. Um, if you wanted to, you could say, "Hey, give me the sum of of g," and this the generator will be, "Oh, okay. Now you're asking for all of the work, and so it will it will generate all of the values and sum them all up." Okay. Um, here you can ask sum, and it's going to give you the same same thing. But now, now that the generator has been uh, executed, the, the generator is done. You can't, once it finishes generating all of these things, it's done. You can't, we can't go back and ask for some G again later, okay? All right. Uh, last topic, and we might finish early, is are the map and lambda functions, okay? Uh, this is a little bit like uh, apply. In, in R, in uh, R you might have seen the apply family of functions, you know, where you uh, you take a, a function and you apply it to each element in say a list, you got L apply, and then you have S apply, which tries to simplify it, and T apply, which applies it, you know, according to things in the table and stuff. Map map is kind of like that. You take, you, you say map, you map the function, onto some kind of iterable object. So whether that be a list, a string, a tuple, whatever it is, you take a function and it's gonna, it's gonna map itself to every element inside that iterable object. And then um, what you get back is a map, a map object, which, which is itself iterable. It's a, it's a little bit like a generator object, okay? So, so when you do uh, map the function to an iterable, it creates, Something that you can kind of think of as a generator object, okay, in that it's not going to evaluate everything all at once unless you ask it to evaluate everything, um, everything in there, okay? Uh, and then there's something called a lambda function that allows you to create basically an unnamed short function without having to formally define it, okay? So sometimes you just want to uh, the the operation that you want to apply is like a simple a simple function, but um, that that you need to define yourself. But you don't actually want to like declare this function, and you can create kind of this lambda function in the in the interim. Okay, um, I'm going to use just a, a simple regular expression. Okay, so I'm using import re for giving us a regular expression handling here. And here, uh, my, I'm going to define a function called replace space. Replace a space, and uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to substitute using regular expressions. It's going to substitute uh, one or more space characters with basically a single space character, right? So slash s is any kind of white space object. So that includes like tabs. Uh, I, basically tabs, <laughs> and there's there's technically other white space characters. There's like non-breaking white space, breaking white space, which is your normal white space character, you know, stuff like that. Um, and here the plus says one or more. Okay, so so basically, if there's a whole bunch of spaces in a row, it's going to just replace that with just a single space. Okay, so here I've got hello space 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 Alabama space after that, and then it just replaces the multiple spaces with a single space. Here there's a single space after the A in Alabama, and it just kind of leaves it, right? Because it replaced that space character with just one space character. Okay, so here is a, a list, or I've got just different things here, okay? And it's gonna go through and it's gonna apply. Uh, we're gonna map, uh, replace space, Okay, we're going to map this replace space function onto this text. And here I get a map object, okay? 
and uh, and so you know what I could do is I can iterate over the uh, the map object. Let me let me see. Let me evaluate that. So you get uh, a map object. Let me. Um, We'll do this, and then I think if I call, okay. So this this is kind of like a, it's if if you, it it's like a, the the map object again is kind of like a generator object, and that you can call keep calling next on it, okay. Or, um, in in this case. I just said, you know, iterate through the whole thing and print everything out. Okay, so it's going to uh, iterate through the whole whole thing here. Okay, and so it now we have hello Alabama, and then it, it did Georgia, etc., and then it replaced the double space in South Carolina. Okay. Okay. Uh, if we wanted to, you know, you could take a generator object. And wrap it inside list, and then it will generate everything and throw it into a list as well. So this is uh, so you can do that. Okay. Um, here, because this function back here replace space is such a simple function. Okay. You technically don't have to. Say uh, necessarily define it. Okay, so here rather than say use the uh, the function replace space, here I'm just generating a an anonymous function, or I'm de defining an anonymous lambda function here. Okay, so lambda is basically like saying function x. So notice when you or uh, define right. So notice when you define a function, you say define uh, the function name x. And basically, we're going to, this part is going to, instead of doing define the function name, it just becomes lambda. What's the input argument? So here we're going to say lambda, the input argument x, and then the value that's going to be returned is going to be substitute the pluses, uh, the, the spaces with a single space, okay, on, uh, on x. And so, uh, so it basically runs through that, okay? Um, here, if I wanted to do something similar, but I'm going to just take the text and uh, the existing text and make it title case, all right? So here we have you know weird capitalization here, and uh, and I can say uh, make it title case, and that's going to capitalize each first character after a space. So we have that. Okay, Th this is a separate function, so it's not replacing the spaces. But it's you know doing just cleaning up a little bit of the uh, the capitalization stuff, okay. And uh, and basically, you know, any kind of lambda function you want to define, you can have it have multiple arguments, and you just say lambda, and then whatever multiple arguments you have, and then you have the colon, and then you have the expression that's going to get returned, right? And so these are meant for just very simple functions. You don't want to have anything that's more than one line. As far as the lambda function goes, uh, just a very simple thing. I mean, you, technically they could be complicated, okay? But as far as readability, generally it's recommended you keep your lambda functions to to maybe like one line or one one concept there. All right. So here we're going to say uh, map lambda, and here I'm going to take in two arguments x and y, and we're going to do uh, return x plus y, and I'm going to give it two iterables, two lists, one, two, three, and 100, 200, 300, and it's going to do, you know, it's going to pair up x with y, and it's going to add them together, and we get 101 x plus y, and it gives us 202, and so on and so forth. Okay, and again, here the map object is like a generator, and so in order to get all of the results, I'm putting that the result of the map object inside the list to kind of just get all the results right away.
Is that good? Any questions here? The, the, so you can see there's a lot of potential. And I just have very, very simple examples here. But there's a lot of potential. And, and lambda functions are quite popular among people who write Python and stuff. So you'll, you'll often see you know, this keyword lambda, and you go, what, what is this thing? Okay? And it's basically just an anonymous function. It's a function that somebody didn't feel like defining and giving a, a formal name to, just because it's going to be kind of used in this one-off case. And, uh, and so it's, it's handy in those, in those circumstances. OK, let me go ahead and give you your last view quiz answer. Last view quiz answer today is B, B as in bear. B as in bear, and that's your last view quiz answer. And, uh, and that's all I have uh, for you today. So uh, we'll end here. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week, week nine. And then, um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post homework five up uh, here. Uh, I was thinking of just laying off of data camp stuff, but I don't know. Do you guys want more? No, you guys are shaking your heads. Okay, that's fine. Um, so anyway, data camp, I, I hope you found it to be a helpful resource, okay? Um, and again, you get, uh, you have premium access to their premium product up through, I think, June, right? So we started in January, you get six months of it. So, so up, through, uh, up through June, basically. And uh, so, you know, take advantage of it. You know, I know right now it being eighth week and, you know, ninth, ninth and tenth week, you probably don't have a lot of free time to spare. But, you know, maybe over spring break, if you feel like, <laughs> if you feel like getting into it, you could, uh, you can do a, a few uh, chapters or courses on data camp. I, I think it's really good stuff on there. But yeah, uh, just want to kind of play it a little easy these last few weeks. Okay, have a good weekend. We'll see you guys on Monday.